Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John with Murder by the Book, uh, coming to you live from my living room for another uh, virtual author event. Tonight, we're really excited to have David Joy with us. Um, he's here to talk about his newest book, which just came out Tuesday, um, uh, When These Mountains Burn. And we're really excited to have S.A. Cosby here with us. Uh, his book, Black Talk Wasteland, came out a little bit earlier this year, um, and he is going to be chatting with David. Uh, so before I get into it, let me tell you a little bit about these guys. Uh, David Joy is the author of The Lion That Held Us, winner of the 2018 SIBA Book Prize, The Way to This World, and Where All Light Tends to Go, which was an Edgar finalist for Best First Novel. His stories and creative nonfiction have appeared in a number of publications, and he's the author of the memoir Growing Gills, A Fly Fisherman's Journey, and a co-editor for Gather at the River. 25 authors on fishing. Uh, Joy lives in Tusk... Tuskus... <laughs> <laughs> How do you say that? <laughs> uh, I live in uh, Tuckasagee. There we go. Uh, North Carolina. Um, I feel like I'm really usually good at that, but I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, and uh, S.A. Cosby is a writer from Southeastern Virginia. He won the 2019 Anthony Award for Best Short Story for The Grass Beneath My Feet and his pre previous books, including Brotherhood of the Blade and My Darkest Prayer. He resides in Gloucester, Virginia. When not writing, he is an avid hiker and chess player. How are you guys doing tonight? We're doing good. Awesome. So doing if you guys good. good, if you guys are watching on Facebook, I am going to let these guys chat for a little bit. If you have questions for either author, you can drop them in the comments. Um, I'm going to be chatting with you guys on Facebook before I pop back over here to relay those questions to you. So I'm going to pop away and let you guys talk, and I will see you in a little bit. All right. Well, man, it's good to finally meet you virtually in person. How you doing? Yeah, yeah, it's good to meet you as well. Um, real quick before we get started, I, I just want to say I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, um, the line that holds us uh, is probably one of my top five uh, rural noir stories. I don't, I don't even want to say crime story, just one of my top five rural noir stories. It has such an incredible voice and strength and depth of character and uh, Growing up where I grew up in southeastern Virginia, I, I know a lot of guys and gals that are are uh, are represented very well in that book. So I just wanted to say that. But we're here to talk about your new book, When These Mountains Burn. And um, you want to give the people just a little the little five second or uh, elevator pitch about it? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm kind of out of luck because we ain't got elevators. So I'm, I've never been good at the elevator <laughs> pitch. Uh, but uh, it's kind of uh, it's a story looking at at kind of the the current opioid epidemic in uh this in southern appalachia more specifically western north carolina uh but the story of a father whose son is an addict uh and then and then parallel in that storyline is is a is a story of a of a native cherokee addict uh and then those those lives just kind of intersect and and everything falls to shit like it always does in my books <laughs> hey that's 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 what people come for that's you know that's yeah. like, <laughs> i think that's i think that's the thing about writing for fiction that's either crime centric or crime tinged is that people want to see how things fall apart and see how the characters are able to try to put them back together um i guess i'll start with a couple of questions i'd made some notes and, and, some, and some ideas um and we've talked about this before through email but what do you think separates Appalachia from the rest of the country, not just geographically, but as far as like culture and soci uh, sociologically, like what do you think makes it special, makes it different? And um, what are some of the things that uh, that you love about it? And what are some of the things that maybe bother you about yeah, it? Uh, well, I think, I think from the outside perspective, we like to talk about Appalachia as if it's a place uh, that you visit on the weekend. Like, you know, or like I've been to Appalachia when the reality is, you know, you're talking about a, a, a region that stretches across uh, 13 states. Uh, there's it's 420 counties. Uh, it's 205,000 square miles. You know, it's 40,000 square miles bigger than the state of California. Uh, so you're talking about a really giant area. And uh and when most people think about Appalachia too, they're thinking coal country, you know, they're thinking West Virginia, uh, Eastern Kentucky. People here don't know dick about coal. Uh, you know, we never, uh, coal, coal wasn't here. Uh, but I think one right. thing that, that kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a long history of exploitation in this region. Um, 
and and whether that be coal or whether that be timber uh, or whether that be the place that Purdue Pharma dumped oxycotton for decades, uh, it's it's continuously been a place that's been exploited by outside wealth, um, and and so I think I think maybe that's one of the defining characteristics, uh, along mm-hmm. with people who are. Uh, you know, doing the best with, with the hand they were dealt, uh, you know, working class, working class stories are, are really what I'm interested in telling, uh, as far as kind of the, you know, some of the things, uh, I've written a lot. This, this book is largely about kind of the, uh, the death of a culture that I think we're experiencing right now. Uh, and I mean the death of, of the, what we would traditionally think of as the old mountain culture, uh, and mm-hmm. some of the things that are being questioned at the same time uh, are things that have needed to be questioned uh, and 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 taken apart, whether that be uh, racism, you know, or whether that be homophobia or, uh, you know, there were a lot of there were a lot of uh, things that I think existed in in this culture historically that are that are. Uh, being changed as well so it's not all it's not all good it's not all bad it's uh you know and and like all writers I think I'm most interested in the gray Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that's the that's the color that interests me most yeah so I I think just what I'm hearing is what I say a lot of times about you know the uh the black rural southern experience is that it's not a monolith that it's you know it's full of multitudes and, and there's, you know, various shades of gray and different levels and, and people, individuals are, you know, doing the best they can with what they got and their experiences are not easily defined. You know, you know there's things that unite us being in a rural um, area and there are things that are individualistic that, you know, you can't just paint everybody with a broad brush. I definitely agree with that. I definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, the, the, the men, the main characters in, in the, When the Mountains Burn, uh, Ray and, and his son Ricky and, and Denny and um, even the DEA agent. Um, at first, when you start reading the book, they seem to be traditional, I don't want to say stereotypical, but traditional male archetypes of this kind of genre. You know, Ray is, 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 a, is a smart guy. He's tough. He, you know, he's, he, he's someone that, like I said, growing up where I grew up, I know people like that. Um, Ricky is a you know, unfortunately, a four-year-old opioid addict, and uh, you know, his friend named Denny, who's also an addict. But these guys are, uh, in the beginning of the book, very you know, archetypical tough guys. But as you go further along into the book, you know, you see the complexities and the layers, and and you find out way more about them, and they're way more than what you may uh, assume. Um, I hate asking this question, but if people ask me this question, I'm gonna ask it to you. Do you feel a duty or a responsibility to articulate these complexities of rural men and women to maybe audiences that probably have pretty firm preconceived notions? Uh, I think that's I think that's something that's easy for people like me and you to get right in that uh, we're not writing about a place that we don't know. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. when I imagine a character like Ray or you imagine a character like Beauregard in Blacktop Wasteland, uh, that character is already fully rounded out and carries emotional depth uh, because we know them. Uh, And so I think, I think maybe that's, uh, it's easier. It's easier when you're writing from an authentic place uh, than it would be if you were say, a writer in Boston and you thought, well, I'm going to set a, I'm going to set a story in Appalachia. Uh, odds are you're going to get it wrong. Uh, you, you might, you might do a good job at it. Uh, but odds are you'll get it wrong. I can think of very few writers who are able to, who are able to do that. Well, uh, one that comes to mind is Ace Atkins, uh, yeah. you know, Ace Atkins, the Quinn Colson series, he gets Mississippi absolutely right. And then that Robert Parker, uh, you know, Boston series that he continues he gets Boston right uh 
he's just a lot more fucking talented than than most of us. Uh, you know, I I, I don't I think that. Agree with that. I, <laughs> yeah. I definitely agree with that because I am not setting any books in New York City anytime soon. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I just can't see it happening. I, I love the place. I love visiting, but yeah, I, I just I don't have enough Google Earth, enough time to get it straight. So <laughs> I definitely yeah. I, I agree with that. I think you know when you're writing from a place of authenticity. Um, it's easier to get the nuances, the little things right, the little intric, you know, idiosyncrasies and intricacies that somebody who doesn't grow up in, a, in, a, in an area like that may get wrong. That doesn't mean people shouldn't try. You know, that's that's you know, definitely, you know, you have freedom to try whatever you want. But I think it is. You can tell, you know, it just, you know, it's a difference between, you know, a Waterford Crystal Ping and just a glass from Dollar General. You yeah. know, you can tell yeah. the difference. And so, uh, I definitely agree with that on a on a. a wholeheartedly and yeah you're right by ace i've i've had the opportunity to meet him um i only met him once in person but uh yeah he's he's uh he's a sharp tag i yeah, tell you yeah. um, <laughs> like that guy a lot um so like i said before i grew up in a small town uh on uh, you know close to the chesapeake bay uh, uh a 30 minute boat ride from the eastern shore uh grew up in a small town with a lot of poverty around me grew up in poverty myself and so a guy like ricky i know guys like ricky i i, I know guys like that you know who start out in 2021 a party guys that like to have a good fun they go to a field party and they're always the one that you know brings the, the mad dog 2020 and then somewhere along the way they make a wrong turn and 20 becomes 40 and you know that their life is you know falling to, to shatters is shattered in front of them and so at the beginning you see this this all this pain that ricky has brought on Ray, you know, and, and, you know, his, yeah, his mom passed away, but there's a lot of stuff that Ricky did and you can see how it's affecting Ray. And so you see all this damage he's done. But for me personally, I started to feel sympathetic for Ricky. You know, I started to feel bad for him as a person. Um, yeah. it may that has to do, I guess I know a lot of people like that who have unfortunately gotten found themselves caught up in the opioid addiction. And so when you were writing Ricky, was your intention to make him sympathetic or do you find him a sympathetic character at all? Uh, well, I think, I think, uh, you know, I inevitably do. And it's, it's for the same reason and that I've known addicts my whole life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Ricky carries a single motivation in this, in this novel, uh, you know, and, uh, and that's the truth of, of anybody who is at that point of, of addiction, uh, is it is it is a hand to you know he, he is a hand to mouth heroin addict, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that's the that's the that's the governing factor of every every decision he makes. Uh, He's and, on a mission, correct. And 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 yeah. so I I think I think to remain authentic to that story, uh, you can't really alter that. Uh, you know, me me knowing people like Ricky my whole life. Uh, nine times out of 10, if they were telling you something, uh, that they wanted to get clean or they wanted to do this, or they wanted to do that. The reality is that it was, that it was, uh, you know, they, they carried an ulterior motive that they, that they were trying to do something else. And, and I think, uh, Ricky is very much that way. Uh, you know, I th there's a scene in that, in that novel where, uh, Ray is taking care of Ricky. Ricky's had the hell beat out of him by some people. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and the doctor comes and the doctor brings, uh, some, some hydrocodone, uh, mm -hmm. for him. And his father's trying to have this, this heart to heart, real conversation with his son. And Ricky's mind is, when did he tell me when I could get that next pill? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that, and I think that's the reality of, of, uh, of addiction when it gets to that level the same thing with denny rattler yeah. I, th I, th I think denny's a more complicated character in a lot of ways mm -hmm. uh but he's still driven in that same way uh, it's a one-track mind uh, yeah. and whether that be alcohol or i mean alcoholics uh same thing it, it's it's thinking about the next drink uh you know whatever that whatever that addiction is uh it tends to when it gets to that level, it reduces uh, your mind to, to kind of a single track destination. Jumping on that for a second, do you think, I, well, you know, I know, again, going back to my background growing up, 
that I saw people like that. And it seemed like being in a small town, you know, we're talking about maybe the medical infrastructure. If, if you did find somebody who genuinely wanted to get clean, who really tried, they, they seemed like there was like two major obstacles, you know, that there's this idea of I'm trying to get clean, but you can't, they don't want to get away from the friends that they made, which aren't really their friends, the people they get high with. That's, I think there's a distinction. But also, you know, for me, like where I grew up at, the nearest hospital with any kind of rehab facility is like 60 miles away. You know, it's in the state yeah. capital. And so I wonder, you know, again, with the Appalachia and with rural areas, I mean, that infrastructure not being there, that has to, that, I think that plays a big part in the severity of the opioid crisis down there around oh, us. Yeah, right. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's largely what this, what this novel eventually gets at. Um, you know, this is the first novel that I've ever uh, written across race. And I think, it, especially if you're a, a white male writer, you better have some damn good reasons for doing that. Uh, and you better do everything within your power to get that right. And I knew mm -hmm. why I wanted to do that. I knew why I wanted to make the character of Denny Rattler Eastern Band. Uh, and it was because uh, what's amazing is that is that in this county, in Jackson County, where I live, there are zero resources available uh, to to somebody who's, uh, you know, s suffering that type of addiction is in those types of uh, economic circumstances. If you ain't got money and they can't ship you off somewhere to go to a rehab, there ain't rehab. Uh, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, on the boundary, uh, the Cherokee have done an incredible job, uh, especially over the past past 20 years of investing in infrastructure uh it I, I think it's a really prime example of what good socialized programming could look like in this country uh it you know if you're a kid born there college is bought and paid for if you want to go to college it's paid for uh mm -hmm. they put money into addiction services they put money into mental health services uh and that's not to say that that all of those things are being fully utilized uh mm -hmm. but they're putting the money there and so that was the reason that I wanted that character to be Cherokee and that, and, and then the character of Ricky to be a white guy from, from Jackson County is that I wanted to juxtapose two community responses. And the truth is that, that everywhere else, uh, pretty much everywhere else in this whole country, uh, we have done a piss poor job of taking, of taking care of people like this. Uh, we refuse mm -hmm. to recognize a, addiction as, as, uh, a characteristic of, of mental illness as a, as, as a disease. Uh, we leave these people to fend for themselves mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that we do schools. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you grew up in a place like this or, or where you grew up, uh, there ain't yeah. money going into those schools. Uh, and, and so I, I think when I, when I wrote this novel, I really wanted to juxtapose uh, those two community responses, as well as uh, juxtapose the kind of cultural extinction that's taken place for uh, old mountain culture, uh, like mm -hmm. like Raymond's, and then uh, the revitalization and revival of of Cherokee culture. Uh, you know, I mean, 20 years ago they had a language on the brink of extinction, and now they've got children being raised as native speakers. Uh, yeah, and, that's and fascinating. So, yeah, and I, I just wanted to play. I, I I thought that that added a lot a lot of depth uh, mm -hmm. to the novel. It allowed for me to make kind of a broader statement than if I had said it all just uh, just within Jackson County's boundaries. That's interesting because, like you said about school, I knew growing up where I came from, they put more money into football helmets than they did textbooks. Yeah, you know, it was like everybody. Yeah, it was all about sports and and football specifically and. You know, we were using old textbooks and we didn't get our first computer. We didn't, I didn't actually, I'm dating myself, but we didn't get our first computer so after I graduated out of high school. So I definitely see that lack of investment in the community and in, 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 in education. At the same time, you know, everybody around you is telling you, go to college. You got to go to college. Well, you know, give me some college prep classes, please, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. So I definitely, yeah, that's, I, I definitely agree with that. I definitely see that as, and, uh, you know, it, that goes line and line with the uh, medical infrastructure and the lack of, you know, adequate health care. Again, like you were saying, addicts around that, you know, once they get to a certain point and they're, they're left for them to fend for themselves, nobody cares. No, nobody. Yep. And they keep getting locked up. It's a lot of recidivism and, and everything. And you do a great job of really examining that. 
um, in this book and also in some of your previous books. But um, that makes me, that brought me to another question uh, just popped in my head. So when the line that holds us, to me, I haven't read it and really enjoyed it. Um, the character, the main character, he's in this war. He's, has this, he's, he's fighting a battle with himself. Like he's telling himself every page that he can't get out of here. He can't get out of here. There's no use trying. But there are flashes in that book where you see that he maybe wants to get out. That you see that he maybe wants to build a life with his high school, high school sweetheart. Um, this book didn't seem to have that glimmer of optimism. Maybe it 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 seemed that these and maybe because these were older people. These are all you know. Every the main characters are all people on the north side of thirty, and it just seemed like I don't want to say spinning their wheels, but it they just didn't seem to have that glimmer of hope i mean is that something you see maybe uh just specific to this book or has your personal outlook on things changed a little bit well i think uh i I wanted to write a book i recognized really early on when these characters kind of you know arose uh i recognized really early on that both of them uh raymond mathis and denny rattler felt like they were witnessing the end of something uh Mm -hmm. I know mm-hmm. for a fact that they that they both felt like they were witnessing the end of the world. Uh, and that was the reason I set this novel at the time that I did. I set it during mm-hmm. the fall of 2016 uh, when the mountains were quite literally burning down around us. Uh, there mm-hmm. were days you would go outside and you, could, you couldn't see the sun for the smoke. Uh, you couldn't mm-hmm. breathe. Uh, you put that right beside of... Uh, of the electoral landscape that we had in, in the fall of 2016. And, and, uh, I, I think if you're going to think of a contemporary time when it honest to God felt like the fucking world was ending, that's when it felt like the world was ending. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know that, I don't know that either of these characters, uh, carry any sort of hope for escape in the way that maybe some of my characters in the past have. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think the character of Raymond Mathis feels very much like, uh, like he's the, he's the last of a dying breed. Uh, you know, that, that the culture he, he looks around and, and nothing's familiar anymore. Mm. Uh, the stuff that he grew up with, the people, the places, the culture, all of it's gone. Uh, and with Denny Rattler, I think it's the opposite, uh, in some ways in that, uh, he looks around and sees all of this revitalization happen, and he feels like an absolute cliche. Uh, here's the addict Indian, uh, you know. Yeah. And he yeah. looks around. He looks around at uh, at at cultural reclamation that he can't identify with and he can't be a part of with because he's yeah. he's a Native American cliche. He's an Amer- he's an American cliche. Uh, he's mm-hmm. somebody who got injured at work and got handed opioids and fell into heroin. Uh, yeah. And so I think for both of those characters, they don't, it's hard for them to see, uh, see any way of getting past those things. That's an interesting juxtaposition between those two characters, seeing things in a different way, but ultimately feeling very similar that they feel yeah. like there's a, they've come to the end of a road. That's the, I like, that's, that's very, I like that. That's really cool. Um, uh, like not to get too highfalutin and, and stuff, but the fire in this book, you know, based on a real fire that, like you said, that happened, it seems to be to me a little bit of a metaphor for the lives of Ray and Ricky and Denny. It's out of control, it's destroying everything in his path. Um, but then also there's the promise or the hope after a fire of rebirth. Um, did do you feel that? I mean, I, I, people always ask me, do I put intentional metaphors in my books? And sometimes, yeah, sometimes no. Sometimes I just think a sometimes a car is just a car. But um, <laughs> you know, uh, was that something that was on your mind as you were writing? I think you kind of answered it already. But well, I, th- I think it was definitely a metaphor, uh, or or rather, I think that it was a a tool to try to create you know that idea of uh, of the world ending. And then at the end of the book, yes, uh, I, I think that it does become a metaphor, uh, mm-hmm. and it becomes a metaphor for hope in the in the same way that you're saying. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a moment in that in that novel uh, where Raymond Mathis says that says that all it takes is a is a foot of open ground to stop a fire, 
and and that's the truth when they're, when they're mm -hmm. digging fire ditches you know all they've got to do is is sometimes dig a ditch of a foot uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh and they can stop a fire and, and 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 that becomes a metaphor i think for him uh looking at some of the actions that have taken place in the novel uh thinking that maybe if if enough people uh care and if enough people do do things that we need to do uh there might be some things that that we could actually save yeah i definitely i think that's true i, I definitely agree with that and i think that you know um there's definitely hope toward the well toward the end of the novel in in a way a, a very a very uh hard one and tarnished hope but still hope there um i do like uh the fact that um ray he's someone he's not a criminal you know he's, he's a former uh you know uh forester agent and you know but he's a, he's a person that's strong willed and strong he has strong ideas and he loves his son there's definitely a, a strong connection between him and ricky even though ricky is such such a fuck up yeah. and Ray feels a little bit of guilt that maybe he wasn't paying attention because his wife was dying. We learned that in the beginning of the book. Um, but I do like that Ray is not a quote unquote professional criminal. He's just a guy. Yeah. He's just a man that's taking these steps to try to help his son. And um, do you feel like uh, there's an, do you feel like there's an, uh, that kind of character is maybe more interesting to write about the one that's not a professional like you you referenced black tie wasteland before thank you for that um where you know beauregard is a semi-professional criminal he's been out yeah. of the game for a while yeah. but um do you feel like there's uh you can maybe mine more dramatic tension out of a character who you know doesn't know all the ins and outs but is willing to dive into that world yeah well i think um so a lot of a lot of my work has started with uh with a singular instance or a singular story that i that i know is true uh and and that opening uh that opening scene uh an opening conflict of of raymond mathis is something that's true uh in that i had this old man that i knew uh whose son had gotten really really bad off he had gotten really bad off on methamphetamine uh, but he got a phone call one night and they basically said, pay us what, pay us what we're owed or we're killing him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this old man told me this story of driving up the mountain with $10,000 in cash and a shotgun in his lap. And so I mm -hmm. had this, Im I had this image of that and I knew this man fairly well. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but, but so I had this image, uh, and, and I just, uh, I know that he knew, I know that the man I knew knew for a fact he couldn't save his son. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet there was something that made him drive up the side of that mountain. Uh, mm -hmm. and that, that became something that I think was really interesting for me, uh, was, was mm -hmm. trying to examine that. And I also know that, that men who were like that, uh, old time mountain men, uh, you know, people, th people think of it as lawlessness, but it was never lawlessness. It was that, it was that, it was self-sufficiency uh, mm -hmm. and it was tight knit community. And it was the fact that there are still places in this County that if you call nine one one, it might be an hour and a half before they get there. If they ever get there. Right. So if you don't handle it yourself, it's not getting handled. Uh, and, and so I can, right. think, I can think of old examples of, of, for instance, you know, child molesters, they mm -hmm. just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody does something else. They burn their house down. Uh, you know, they, there was a, there was an old type of, uh, it was justice. Mm -hmm. It was law and order and it was justice, but it was dealt by, by people who were not lawmen. Uh, it's funny. <laughs> it's so funny. You say that because I grew up, yeah, I, I grew up with stories of my uh, great grandfather, um, you know, uh, my, my great uncle used to own a, 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 a shot house and uh, some guys uh, came down and tried to put him out of business and beat him up. And I, I grew up with a, there's a family legend that my, my great grandfather uh, tricked these guys to meet him only for deer stand and, uh, you know, put a, uh, put a cue ball in a sock and went to work. And so, yeah, I definitely can identify with that i understand that you know i grew up you know this <laughs> there's a section of town uh where i live at uh where the watermen 
launch their boats. And there's always a saying that, you know, there's a lot of different kind of bait that go in a crab pot. So yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes things get taken care of. I definitely yeah. understand that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I definitely understand that. And I think that's, um, I think that makes for interesting movies and writing and fiction. Um, but it also, I think growing up in a place like that gives you a certain sense of right and wrong, you know, and yeah. I, I think it's, there are things that are shades of gray, but then there are things that are, you know, axiomatic. I've lost you. this, I think, you know. Um, There's a question, uh, a little more about current events and everything with all the stuff going on with the pandemic. And you've been pretty vocal about your love of the land that you live on and, and, and being just really advocate for uh, good environmental management. Do you feel with the pandemic and the desire of people to escape its effects that rural America is seen as some kind of oasis? And, you know, it seems like, a lot of people are coming, they want to get away from, you know, the COVID and they're coming to the mountains or they're going down into the hills and they don't really understand or appreciate the responsibility that they have of being, you know, stewards of the land, so to speak. Um, do you think that's something that you've seen or have heard about? And oh, yeah. yeah. Do you think that's something that is, uh, yeah. Well, I think that yeah, was but, something that was taking place here, uh, even before COVID, uh, but absolutely, you know, if you were if you were living in a in a city right now and, and a city was locked down, and then all of a sudden you have a a lot of social strife taking place in the streets, uh, and you got the money to get the hell out, they're getting the hell out. And let's be clear, we ain't, we're talking about one group of people. We're talking about rich ass white folks uh, who have the money to leave. Uh, who are right. who are leaving those urban centers and and fleeing to fleeing to rural places yeah. uh, and that's and that's something that's happened here where i live uh you know for decades and decades uh and what we're experiencing right now is that is uh is rural gentrification uh mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's people being priced out uh, yeah. what what we're becoming where i live uh in this part of appalachia is bedroom communities uh, that I, I, I saw some real estate research recently that where they asked, uh, they asked potential buyers who, who wanted to live in Western North Carolina. They said, uh, what type of commute are you willing to endure in order to live here? And they said an hour and a half, mm. well, an, an hour and a half from here, hell you could work in Knoxville. Uh, <laughs> and so these people, I mean, you're talking about people who, uh, you know, the idea of, of buying a house with five acres and let's say it costs $250,000. Well, that's a joke to them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, as soon as these houses are going on the market, uh, they are scooped up and, and the mm -hmm. prices are going up and going up. Uh, mm -hmm. And people who have been here for generations are being displaced. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have the money to stay. They never had anything to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there aren't any jobs here that that's going to allow them to stay because they force tourism down our throats for decades, mm -hmm. never once recognizing that it's an extractive economy. Uh, and yeah. so, yeah, I, I, I think, I think maybe we've seen it be spurred even more in the past few months, uh, as mm -hmm. these people start fleeing, uh, the cities. And I think it's something that's just going to get worse and worse. Uh, you know, as, as we start to see, uh, broadband expansion for instance uh and mm -hmm. that allows more and more people to work remotely uh in a post-covid world where businesses have recognized that they don't have to have that inner office relationship anymore that that you know they can cut overhead by allowing employees to work remotely uh all of a sudden you're not tied to a place anymore and all of a sudden you've got people who have been making a hundred two hundred thousand dollars a year uh they're not going to want to live in San Francisco where the average house costs $2 million. Uh, why the hell would yeah. you, uh, you know, yeah, they're, they're I definitely, move. I definitely, yeah. yeah. Cause I'm, I'm seeing, I've seen that here, you know, I live in, there's wide swaths of acreage, 15 acres, 20 acres, you know, and, and people that are coming out of the cities, out of DC, out of Richmond and they're buying it up, you know, God bless them. But like you said, there's, you know, little Miss Nettie that lives next door 
and now her taxes are going through the roof because she lives in like a single wide trailer or maybe she has a, a, a one story house that you know belonged to her mom and so now her taxes went from like maybe two hundred dollars a year to two thousand and so yeah. there's definitely a regentrification or a rural gentrification that's happening um yeah. in the areas you know and I think it 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 is something that we're gonna see accelerate like you said and you're gonna see you know all life comes down to I think choices and and I think one of the choices some people make is crime and as a crime fiction author that's gonna you know I, I think about that a lot because that type of regentrification forces a lot of people out it forces a lot of people in you know, feel like they got their back against the wall. So it's definitely, it's interesting, you know, that like you were saying about broadband, it's interesting that for years in my little small hometown of Matthews County, we begged for broadband. We begged for high speed, you know, for you doing stuff at home, trying to work at home, couldn't get it. And then like five years ago, people discovered the waterfront and now, you know, broadband is being shipped in by the, you know, by the, by the mile. And so, you know, it's, you know, money talks and everything else walks. That's definitely Definitely the truth, I think. I definitely feel that way. Um, uh, another question, uh, back to the book. Um, like the whole plot with the D DEA agent and uh, his storyline, it seems at first it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with, well, it doesn't seem like it's, it's running parallel to Ray and Ricky and Denny, but then, of course, as things happen, it seems like it's more involved than we first um, first see. Um, do you feel like, you know, the the, the law enforcement agencies, uh, the big, you know, the, the, the alphabet agencies, um, it feels like to me sometimes reading articles and, and, and talking to people that I know, you know, I have friends that live in Kentucky, I have friends that live in Tennessee, that it's, it's not, it seems like those agencies there, it's it's it seems like they're, they're fighting a war of attrition, and they're not fighting it correctly yeah. with the opioid uh, addiction problem. That you know, you you bust a house, you bust a meth lab, you know, you bust an old trailer, or everybody's getting high, and you put those five or six people in in jail, but you're not getting you know the main plug, as they say, you're not getting the main supplier. And yeah. so, I mean, do you feel like it's a war of attrition down there where you're at? Well, I think. In some ways, definitely. Uh, you know, one of the aspects of this novel is that a lot of the heroin is coming out of Atlanta and moving into Western North Carolina, and that's a reality mm -hmm. of, of this mm -hmm. place. Uh, and just last week, uh, the DEA had had the largest heroin bust in in uh, Atlanta history, but one of the largest heroin busts uh, in American history. Uh, and so, occasionally, you run across you run across uh, a story like that. But this is the rea this is the reality, is that uh, the people they're putting in jail uh, are are people who uh, have no means to get out and have no means to fight it. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. you take the real fucking criminals. You take the you take the single family who developed this who developed Oxycot, the Sackler family who owned Purdue mm -hmm. Pharma who systematically geographically pumped these drugs into these communities. What, did, what happened to them? Uh, you know, they went bankrupt and they're, and they're having to pay, pay out a bunch of money. But the, the reality is the amount of death on their hands is tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Uh, anybody who's selling drugs in Jackson County and they were able to buy their way out of it because rich white people are always able to buy their way out of it. Uh, and, yeah. and that's, and so when I look at, when I look at the war on drugs in this country, I think that's the, that's the thing that has always struck me, uh, the hardest. And it's because when I think about the single thing that defines my generation, it was that we were, we were farmy kids uh, we had pills shoved down our throats from the time we were in elementary school, whether, whether it was Adderall, whether it was Ritalin, uh, whether it was antidepressants, uh, mm -hmm. the, the truth is that there's not a medicine cabinet in America where there's, where I can't open that, open that door and find something within that, within that cabinet that I can abuse and use to get high. And that shit is being peddled by companies uh who, who never face any type of uh you know criminal 
charges for the things that they're doing. Uh, and, and so oh, when yeah. I look at, when I look at the way that we've handled, you know, drug enforcement in this country, it's the same way that we handle all crime in this country. Uh, you know, you choke a man to death because you think that he may have been trying to use a, a you know, a fake check. Meanwhile, you let Goldman Sachs fucking steal money from every, everybody in this country. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the people, the people who are charged and the people who go to jail are always the same ones. And it's always poor ass people. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think the idea of punitive law enforcement hasn't really caught, done anything for anyone. You know, I, I, I know people that keep getting in trouble because they're addicts and they, they're addicts, so they steal. And when they steal, they get caught. Like you said, meanwhile, Big Pharma doesn't get pro any, anything happen to them. You know, gun, de gun dealers don't get anything happening to them. And I right. speak as a gun owner, you know, yeah. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm someone who hunts, I, I shoot for sport, uh, go to the range and stuff like that. But that being said, it's like those folks never face any consequences for anything no. anywhere ever. And meanwhile, like you said, it's, and we've talked about this before, you know, the poor black and the poor white person or the poor indigenous person or the poor Hispanic person, um, and especially in rural America, is the one that bears that weight and bears that brunt of all that pain and all that, you know, money that's made, all that fortune that's made behind a great crime. And so it's definitely, uh, I think we're at a point of reckoning to a certain extent where people really are taking a hard look at everything involved with law enforcement and how are we, are we doing the best we can to, to try to help the people who need it most? I, you know, so that's definitely something I try to explore in my work and in my writing and, um, you know, and it's, 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 I like with your stuff, um, it, and I try to do the same thing. It's subtextual, like it's yeah. there, yeah. you know, but I'm not writing a sermon. You know, yeah. not Jonathan Edwards, you know, centers in the hand of an angry God. I'm trying to tell you a story. And, you know, like my mom always say, a little bit of a little bit of honey make the medicine go to hell. Yeah. And so I definitely appreciate that subtext that's there that, you know, this is the way these people live. This is how we live. And, you know, hey, here, look at it. I'm going to make you see what's going on. And yeah. hopefully you'll get some out of it. And I definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, so we've been talking pretty heavy. Uh, let's lighten it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> how's your, uh, how you, you been doing any fishing this year? How's the fishing hole going? Man, I, uh, to be honest, we've been rained out for most of it. Uh, it, man, it's, it's dumped rain here since March. Uh, and yeah. when I say dumped, I mean, hell, we've got, it's rare that we don't get a quarter inch, half inch of rain a day. Uh, and so it's, it's been a blowout for a lot of the fishing season. Uh, but I'm seeing a bunch of good deer. Uh, I seen a, I seen a damn, I had to go do a, do one of these events, uh, last night. It was for uh poison pen in Scottsdale. So it, it was filmed delayed as hell for me. But when I was leaving, it was, it was leaving the house. It was right at dusk yeah. and, uh, man, there was a damn stud come out of the woods, uh, and, a and a little forked horn with him. So, so there's some good deer, if nothing else. Yeah, we live where I live, uh, right on my back. I go on my back deck. I can see on the tree line. There's a there was a a, a fawn and a, and a couple of little uh, a doe and a couple of fawns. And then a couple weeks ago, I saw a big old buck, like an eight, eight point, just come running through the field. Just yeah. you know, he was getting it. So it's definitely uh, it's looking good for the fall. But yeah. um, <laughs> it's funny because uh, you same thing. You said it's been raining buckets up here, and I like to go hiking, and I haven't been no hiking all this year because. Yeah. You know, it, it, you get you get 20 feet into a trail and it's like, oh, now I got to swim back. So I definitely, yeah. <laughs> I definitely understand that. Yeah. But, uh, man, I'll tell you what, I, I love the book. I love your work in general, uh, uh, you know, and I, I love your outlook on, uh, on just the way, you know, and like I said, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Growing up in the rural part of America, it's hard being poor. And it's hard being poor and white, and it's really hard being poor and a person of color. But having said that, there are a lot of things that guys like you and I have in common growing up where we grew up that a lot of people in the rest of the country don't get and they don't understand. And it's you know there's a there's a a camaraderie of of ge ge geographical location that a lot of people don't yeah. get. The funniest thing I, I tell a story all the time in uh in Blacktop Wasteland, there's a line. 
where one of the characters turned to another character and says, you know, man, she put her foot in them biscuits. And I had to go to New York and I had to explain to all my uh, <laughs> New York Upper West Side uh, folks that would help me with the book what that means and, and what it what it stands for. And I know when I talk to a guy like you, I ain't got to explain it. So that, that's that's <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I definitely get it, man. So let's see if we get John back on and see. All right. If he's got any questions from the audience. We do. So before we get to audience questions, um, Sean, do you want to give us your elevator pitch for Blacktop Wasteland? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, this is all this is Davis Knight, but real quick, uh, Blacktop Wasteland is a story of Beauregard Bug Montage, a former getaway driver in the rural South who settled down and tried to start himself a little business and grab his piece of the American dream. But unfortunately, financial problems plague him. And so he makes it an ill-fated decision to return to his previous life of crime. And by doing so, he loses almost everything he holds dear, including his prize 71 duster that belonged to his father, Ant who's also the best wheel man in Southeastern Virginia. So that's Blacktop Wasteland available now. now that's, so. a, that's a hell of a damn <laughs> elevator pitch. <laughs> nope. He's a lot better at that than I am. <laughs> yeah, practice, no brother. kidding. Out of practice. <laughs> and so I will say, if you guys want to hear Sean talk more about his book, definitely check out the YouTube video that we did with Walter Mosley, with Rachel Housel Hall uh, moderating. I've dropped the link to that in the comments on the Facebook. So definitely check that out. If you guys are just joining us, we are talking with David Joy about his newest book, Where These Mountains Burn, which just came out Tuesday. He's being interviewed by uh, Sean S.A. Cosby. Um, if you missed the first part of the event, or you can wait till it's done, and Facebook will archive it so you'll be able to catch it from the beginning. We'll also be uploading it to the stores of YouTube in the next couple of days as well. Uh, so to get into the crowd questions, uh, David Trombley asks you, David Joy, where is your bitter southerner ball cap? Oh, it's at the, it's at the house. <laughs> this one's uh, J JLH Strikers. That's a, a turkey call company. Uh, guy named, guy named uh, what's his first name? Something Harrison. Uh, he makes the best turkey call strikers in the country. So if you're into turkey calls and you and you mess with pots, uh, you should look up JLH uh, Strikers. But yeah, I got I got it, and uh, it's sitting at the house. <laughs> Uh, a different David, David Simon, is asking you, David Joy. Um, he says, you write about fly fishing. Uh, have you read uh, Keith McCafferty and his fly fishing novels that are set in Montana? I haven't. Uh, I actually had somebody somebody mention those to me. Uh, I believe I believe they're fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I've never read those. Uh, my stuff really early on, it was influenced. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I wanted to be John G. Rack uh who's a you know a non-fiction writer uh writes probably the best uh fly fishing related essays uh there are but i was influenced more by john g Rack, carry middleton dave ames uh you know james prosek uh all of, all of these uh fly fishing writers and i thought i thought if i could make a living at that i'd 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 have uh you know won the lottery but turns out that those books sell worse than my fucking novels do so, uh, i don't think there's much hope in that yeah. um kind of similar to you uh keith also has done a lot of nonfiction writing he writes for field and stream magazine uh, his newest book also just came out tuesday we chatted with him uh last night uh, so talking about kind of the, the nonfiction stuff that you did uh can you talk a little bit about your journalism experience and how that's influenced your novels I had somebody ask me this. Uh, well, it was a, it was a couple journalists the other day that came up to the house, and they're good journalists. Uh, and I say that because I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> and I, and I and what I mean by that too is like I worked at a newspaper, man. And it was a rag. Uh, we called it the Cross Eyed Chronicle. Uh, it was it was <laughs> called the, the Crossroads Chronicle, but we called it the Cross Eyed Chronicle. And everybody in town they joked. And they, they'd say it was, uh, you know, the David Joy paper because hell, you'd, the whole front page, it'd be nothing but stories I wrote. Uh, and it was just a small town paper, nothing much ever happened. And, and, and uh, but, but the more I got to thinking about it when they asked me that the other day, uh, I thought there are a couple, couple things that I think maybe do translate. And one is, is that inquisitive nature of, of, figuring out what's going on uh and that inquisitive nature to learn as much as you can about whatever the topic is uh and and you know 
I, I think that's something that uh, if you don't carry that with you naturally, that's something that you really can't teach. Uh, and then the other, the other aspect of that, I think, is that really good reporters ask good questions and they know when to shut up and listen. And, and for any type of, uh, you know, fiction writer, uh, I, I think that's an important quality to carry. Um, so uh, David also asks, he says, the indigenous uh, population is a huge victim of COVID, not to mention drugs, violence. Uh, do you feel that your books help us understand their plight? And was that an intention when you started writing? Well, so, so the, that is true as far as what's happening in Cherokee. At the same time, the Eastern Band uh, w that I'm writing about is much different than a lot of other places in the country in that uh, they largely have money. They have enough money to be uh, self-sufficient at this point. And so, for instance, they've done a, I think they've done a better job of COVID testing uh, on the boundary here than we have off of the off of the boundary. Uh, I think when when we had the initial shutdowns, I think they did a better job. There was a literal barrier. Uh, if you weren't an enrolled member, you could not go to Cherokee when when all of this first started. Meanwhile, uh, here, you know, we had flashing signs, uh, you know, governor mandate or whatever. Nobody did nothing. It's the same now. Hell, uh, you know you go to the dollar general, I'm the only one wearing a mask. Uh, and that's true. That's true. Kind of across the board. Um, it's, it's odd to be writing about, uh, the tribe in the way that, in the way that I am, I think, because I think the Eastern band story, especially over the past 20 years has been so much different than a lot of other, uh, other tribes across the country. Uh, you know, here we had, we had, uh, a pre-casino reality and a post-casino reality. And that pre-casino reality was rubber tomahawks, fake arrowheads, dream catchers, uh, headdresses, teepees, pedal anything that you can in order to compete for the tourist dollar so that we can survive. Uh, post-casino reality is we don't need that money anymore. Uh, and so suddenly, all of those things uh, have disappeared in a lot of way. And, and, and what's happened is that there's been a reclamation of, of tradition. There's been a reclamation of culture. Uh, they're putting money into things that matter. They've got better schools on the boundary than we have in Jackson County. Uh, every kid, like I said earlier, every kid that grows up there has the opportunity to go to college. They've got health care. Uh, they have mental health services. They have addiction services. 25 years ago, you had a language on the brink of extinction, and now you've got children being raised as native speakers. Uh, and so I think writing about the Eastern Band, uh, which, is, which is what's here, because this, this, to be clear, this county, Jackson County, borders the boundary. Uh, the Koala boundary butts up against us. We're, we sit against Cherokee land. Uh, and so, and so uh, writing about the reality of this place and this tribe in 2016 is a very different reality from uh, a whole lot of other places in the country. Uh, last question I've got from the crowd. This is for both of y'all. Do either of you see um, using the current pandemic in, in any of your future work? I'm working on something now and call me a pie in the sky optimist, but I'm setting it after, well, I won't say after, I'm setting it in a time when the pandemic is more under control. Yeah. I think it's just the optimist in me. I feel like who wants to read about the pandemic? We're living through it right now. And if anything, I don't want to write about it right now. So mm -hmm. I'm either, the thing I'm working on now is going to be set in a time after. Um, I may write stuff that's set before it just because I, I'm in the middle of it right now and I'm just not in a place where I can be on To be honest, I'm not in a place where I can deal with it right now. And so I'll probably uh, continue to write about the pre-COVID times until things get better, to be perfectly frank. Yeah. 
I think for me, uh, the novel I'm currently working on is, is set, uh, last, it's set last summer. So kind of summer 2019. So before this, uh, but to be honest, uh, well, first of all, no, I, I don't envision myself writing a, a story that's set during this time period. Uh, but to be honest, hell, it would seem like science fiction uh, to be to be <laughs> writing about the masked people. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you if you look at everything that's happening in this uh, country right now, it, Cormac McCarthy couldn't have written something this fucked up. Uh, I mean, man, this is uh, uh, man, this makes damn Blood Meridian seem like the seem like the uh, you know feel good book of the fucking year. Uh, and and so uh, no, I do I don't want to as hopeless as I am as an individual and pessimistic as I am as a writer, I ain't even right. I'm not touching this. I wouldn't touch it with a yeah. ten foot pole. Mm. I finished writing. I finished reading uh, Albert Camus' The Plague earlier this month, and I was like, "Wow, that's that's really hopeful. They really got it under control." I was, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember who it was early on. We were interviewing somebody, and they said, "Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a whole lot of books that were set in 2019, and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that's set in 2021, and there's just going to be this vast wasteland of books that just don't exist for 2020." <laughs> yeah. um, when everything started closing down and everything started happening, people were picking up Emily St. John Mandel's uh, Station Eleven, which is a plague book um, that kind of starts as the plague is starting and then jumps forward. And like somebody tweeted her, like, "Oh, I think now's the perfect time to read Station Eleven. And she's like, "What the hell are you thinking? No, put that book down and read something else." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, read some Frank thank- L. Baum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you guys both so much for um, chatting with us tonight. One of the things that we really, really miss is being able to actually have these conversations in the store. Uh, but one of the things that's really great about being able to do these virtually is we're able to pair up uh, people and have these really great conversations we might not necessarily have been able to have geographically. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, if you guys are watching, I just wanted to mention briefly, the store is still closed for uh, customers coming in but we are doing curbside pickup. We're doing phone orders, mail orders. You can order anything from murderbooks.com, including both of their books, um, or you can order David's earlier paperbacks. You can order Sean's earlier books. Uh, we've got book plates for them. Uh, so that's murderbooks.com. I uh, wanted to mention just a couple of things we've got coming up. We're super excited. Uh, on August 29th is Independent Bookstore Day, and we're gonna be doing a Facebook, our YouTube live event with uh, James Lee Burke in conversation with Stephen King, which we're just crazy excited about. So definitely check that out. Um, and um, I also just dropped a link in the comments. Uh, if you are enjoying these uh, and you already have picked up the author's books, we have a virtual uh, tip jar that you can donate to. Um, still the best way to support the store and to support these authors for giving us their time is to, to purchase their books from us. So we hope that you will do that. Uh, gentlemen, thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah. You guys take care, stay safe, and we will see you soon. Yeah, thank you, thank you guys so much. Have a great night.